of uh, Indian Scientific Gastroenterology. Uh, let me welcome you, uh, you all of you, uh, all for this masterclass. This is a 14th uh, uh, in series masterclass, and uh, now we are in weekly format. We have masterclass once a week. As you all know, that the objective of this masterclass is to provide you uh, the the most updated concepts and most updated clinical information on some of the very important topics which uh, are required for our day-to-day -day practice. And this has been the basic motto of uh, doing ISG Masterclass. The last uh, topic uh, which we had was functional dyspepsia. And all, all of us know it's a very, very common disease. And we had a wonderful lecture last week. And we received a lot many feedbacks uh, appreciating the talk. And uh, I'm sure that uh, most of us are benefited by the talk. Uh, today we have a yet another important topic uh, uh, which is uh, autoimmune liver disease. How to make a diagnosis, how do we treat, and uh, how do we treat uh, a patient who have uh, some special situation. And for that we have uh, uh, a very renowned and uh, very learned speaker, uh, Dr. Salimar. Dr. Salimar is an additional professor of gastroenterology at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And uh, he is uh, uh, very, very uh, I mean, I would say that uh, uh, he's a very learned man and uh, his knowledge is uh, uh, remarkable. He would understand the uh, subject and then let us know what uh, we should do once we treat, uh, once we see a patient who has a suspected to have an autoimmune liver disease. We also know that, uh, uh, that uh, now we, let me request Dr. Uh, Saraswat uh, to speak to you and welcome you. In the addition, let me also welcome Dr. Uday Jacharya, Jakaria, who is a professor of hepatology at uh, CMC Bangalore, and uh, uh, he agreed uh, to moderate this session. Welcome, Dr. Jakaria. Dr. Sarsat, please. Thank you, Dr. Govind. Uh, good morning, uh, once again, uh, viewers, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this 14th edition of the India ISG Masterclass. Uh, the background, the genesis of our masterclass, all of you are familiar with, and um, it has gained popularity. We have developed a core of very loyal uh, participants and viewers, and every uh, term, every time we have them with us. So, uh, that's how that is the basis of our continuing with this activity, although we have come down to a weekly format. Uh, attendance from our neighboring countries also continues to be encouraging. People from Bangladesh, Nepal, and the neighboring South Asian countries, as well as from certain African countries like Kenya, Nigeria, have been participating in our presentations, which is encouraging. We, do, we seem to be fulfilling a need that our viewers uh, uh, have. So now today's topic, as uh, Dr. Govind has just told you, is autoimmune hepatitis. For a long time and still in many parts, we uh, seem to believe that this is a Western disease. We don't commonly see it in India. So it is relatively under-recognized or under-suspected. We generally tend to see people with advanced disease. And uh, in the setting of cirrhosis, uh, there may be possibilities that you are actually swinging the other way and over-diagnosing autoimmune hepatitis because there is some low-level ASMA positivity and uh, that's the only marker in the patient which may be part of cirrhosis and hyperglobulinemia of cirrhosis get labeled as autoimmune etiology. One really has to be cautious about the use of corticosteroids in uh, advanced cirrhosis and decompensation. So raising a lot of problematic issues and... Uh, uh, um, uh, certainly from our country and our part of the world, there's a relative paucity of literature. So to talk about these areas and complexity, we have uh, Dr. Shalimar. Dr. Govind has told you about Shalimar. Shalimar is an additional professor of gastroenterology at the All India Institute and presently is looking after patients with liver disease and carrying forward the proud tradition of hepatology at the All India Institute and the AB2 ward from stalwarts and giants like Professor B. N. Tandon, Professor S. K. Acharya, and now the mantle is uh, on Shalimar's shoulders. Uh, I've really always enjoyed Shalimar's talks. They are very crisp, quite educational, 
authoritative and up to date in his information and i find that i always end up learning quite a lot from the talks now with these few words i request dr shalimar to please uh, begin his presentation thank you thank you sir for the kind introduction and the opportunity to talk on autoimmune hepatitis management keeping in the tradition of having a talk in two breaks and having questions in between i have decided to talk in the first part about the diagnosis and evaluation of autoimmune hepatitis in the second part of my talk i'll talk about the management of autoimmune hepatitis and the different clinical scenario which professor saraswat just talked about the exact pathogenesis of autoimmune hepatitis is unclear but what we know is there are certain environmental triggers associated with a genetic predisposition loss of immune tolerance leads our body to have an attack on its own organ so we have an antibody and a t cell attack on the liver leading on to necro inflammation and fibrosis and this is what we see as clinically autoimmune hepatitis our case for today's class is a 35 year old young lady who presented to us with a history of jaundice she didn't complain of any itching additionally she had a weight loss of 2 kg over the past 1 month she was hypothyroid and was taking supplementation for the same her examination apart from ictus was unremarkable as the first investigation she underwent a liver function test which showed a bilirubin of 3 mg per deciliter liver enzymes were in the range of 10 times so when do we suspect autoimmune hepatitis as a possible etiology in a patient autoimmune hepatitis can have a varied presentation patients may present you with acute symptoms typical mimic of an acute viral hepatitis the history may be of recurrent jaundice in addition some patients may have a severe presentation what we call as acute severe autoimmune hepatitis which is characterized by an elevated inr more than 1.5 typically when such patients with acute severe autoimmune hepatitis develop hepatic encephalopathy and do not have an underlying chronic liver disease that is cirrhosis we call them as acute liver failure the chronic presentations are very varied and constitute almost like two thirds of the patients which you will see in your clinical trials the presentation may be asymptomatic to a symptomatic phase of fatigue anorexia pain malaise joint pains which may be very non specific symptoms in addition patients may present to you with typical presentation of cirrhosis and even decompensated cirrhosis so we should keep a possibility of a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis in every patient who comes to you as an acute presentation chronic presentation cirrhosis decompensated cirrhosis and even for acute or chronic liver failure when we work up a patient for autoimmune hepatitis we need to look for possible other mimics which may be responsible for a similar clinical presentation as we talked about acute hepatitis chronic hepatitis cirrhosis so our etiological workup includes looking for all these factors which may present with any of these clinical manifestations important in our context is to rule out viral heps a to e needs to be ruled out a lot of patients are consuming drugs over the counter and it is well known there are some drugs especially antibiotics other drugs like infliximab and latest to add on to the list are the immune checkpoint inhibitors which may cause an immune mediated liver injury and it is important to elicit from the patient a history about drugs which he has taken and which forms an important differential diagnosis of patients with autoimmune hepatitis in addition always rule out associated alcohol related liver disease and the associated metabolic liver diseases in the form of non alcoholic fatty liver disease including non alcoholic steatohepatitis in addition other mimics may include patients who got an hiv cholangiopathy patients who got granulomatous hepatitis wilson's disease is an important differential needs to be ruled out and in the subgroup of patients if you got a female and you think that patient has other multiple 
faulty system manifestation throughout systemic lupus erythematosus. Celiac disease is often seen as a very common association, and you may find patients with autoimmune hepatitis also having celiac disease. Autoimmune hepatitis may also occur with other autoimmune diseases in the form of primary biliary cholangitis or primary sclerosing cholangitis, IgG4 related disease, and other immune mediated diseases like vitiligo, associated thyroiditis, and diabetes may be a common manifestation or a common association in these subset of patients. So when do we suspect autoimmune hepatitis? This was the initial or a revised original scoring system by the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Group. There are multiple variables and each of these variables have been different scores. So a typical patient, which as this score was given in the early 90s, that's the, would consist of a female with a hepatitic type of picture with an elevated AST as compared to alkaline phosphate, elevated gamma globulin or IgG, positive autoantibodies, negative viral markers, drugs, alcohol, a suggestive histology, other markers in the form of other autoimmune markers, associated immune diseases, and a treatment response. And once you add up all the values of the individual scores, you come to a variable which may give you a possibility whether your patient has an autoimmune hepatitis or not. So this scoring system is important when you've got multiple other associated diseases. So it helps you in ruling them out when you've got a complex presentation. It's complex, it has multiple variables, difficult to use website. So now has been replaced by a simplified scoring system, which consists of only four important components, autoantibodies, immunoglobulin G levels, suggestive histiology, and absence of viral markers. The higher your score, the higher the specificity that you are making a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. Important to understand is that this score will give you a high score when you've got a typical patient of autoimmune hepatitis. So to summarize, so far what we have talked about, our diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis is based on your clinical judgment, not on the basis of your scores, Scores support your diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. A typical presentation would be of a hepatitic type of pattern, more of transaminases, which are elevated, as compared to alkaline phosphatase. You need to rule out all possible other etiologies which may present to you with similar kind of clinical presentation and lab pictures. A positive autoantibody, elevated immunoglobulin G levels, and a liver biopsy, which is suggested. It is important to state out here is that Autoimmune hepatitis may present in any age and in both genders. So both males and females can be affected with autoimmune hepatitis. So when the presentation is not typical, you need to think about whether your patient is having other associated autoimmune liver disease in the form of PSC and TBC. So a typical presentation of PSC would involve an elevated alkaline phosphatase, presence of a biliary stricture, associated inflammatory bowel disease, whereas in case of PBC, it will typically be a female who is middle-aged in the fourth to fifth decade, elevated alkaline phosphatase and a positive autoimmune AMA antibody. So we'll have a separate class on the overlap. So I'll not dwell on the overlaps in the remaining part of my talk. Important to state out here, the AIH patients may over time may also develop other associated autoimmune disorders like PSC and PBC. And similarly, PSC and PBC can over time develop autoimmune hepatitis. What about autoimmune markers? So there are lots of panels available. What are the tests which should I ask for? Should I ask a complete panel? The initial test we should ask for is these three, that is ANA, anti-LKM, ASMA. These are the first line of markers which should be asked for. Among these, only the ASMA is very specific and may correlate with a histological activity index. ANA is not specific and may be present in multiple other diseases also. If these are negative, you can ask for anti-soluble liver antigen, liver pancreas, and atypical PIANCA, which will help you in understanding that my patient possibly has a positive autoantibody. It is also important to know is that in patients who got acute presentation, the autoantibodies may be negative and almost like 20% of patients may be seronegative. And the changes in the concentration are not useful for monitoring 
in contrast to the IgG levels, which we'll talk about. The autoantibodies also help you in differentiating type 2 AIH, which usually presents in childhood, has more inflammation and cirrhosis, and may have more complication, and drug withdrawal is a difficult problem in these patients. So coming back to our case, our case had elevated liver enzymes, Udana viral screen, all is negative, autoimmune markers came as positive, IgG levels were 1.5 times, the alkaline phosphatase showed a borderline increase. So what's the next step? If your alkaline phosphatase is elevated, as we have talked about, think about possible other differential diagnoses. Hence comes the role of imaging. Though there is no characteristic imaging appearance in autoimmune hepatitis, and it is not required for initial diagnosis. So whenever a patient comes to you, ultrasound is the first investigation which you ask for and may show normal, coarse eco texture or a volume redistribution. Important role of ultrasound also comes in those patients who develop cirrhosis, as ultrasound is a screening modality for hepatocellular carcinoma. Apart from that, CT, MR, and MRCP usually do not have a routine role in the evaluation of autoimmune hepatitis. But when you have got complications of cirrhosis or you want to do a diagnosis of cirrhosis, you can ask for these investigations. And when your alkaline phosphatase is elevated and you're thinking of biliary obstruction, overlap syndrome, do ask for imaging. So imaging is typical for diseases like primary sclerosis. image shows you a typical picture of a projectional image of a patient with primary sclerosis cholangitis, where you see these beadings. You can see these beads like appearance, which is focal dilatation of the intrahepatic biliary radicals and pruning of the peripheral radicals. So this is a typical picture for PSC. ERCP has no diagnostic role in PSC per se to highlight and may have some role in the therapeutic aspects. Liver biopsy is not usually recommended for the diagnosis, but may show you typical pictures for PSC if done. Another important differential which comes into play is an IgG4 cholangiopathy. Presence of extra biliary involvement takes you towards a diagnosis of IgG4 cholangiopathy. Along with that, associated IgG4 levels may help you in making a diagnosis of this disease and hence differentiating from an autoimmune hepatitis. So, our case underwent ultrasound. The ultrasound was normal. MRCP was done because she had an elevated alkaline phosphatase. So what's the next step? Should I do a liver biopsy in all? This is a very important and pertinent question which everyone asks. Liver biopsy plays a very important role in the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. Though, as discussed, the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis is based on a high clinical suspicion. The liver biopsy gives you suggestive findings, though none of these findings are very diagnostic for autoimmune hepatitis. But importantly, liver biopsy helps you ruling out other etiologies in associated conditions. It also helps you in knowing the grade of inflammation and fibrosis, which is there at that point of time. So if we do a liver biopsy, as our patient underwent a liver biopsy, the typical changes what you may see is interphase hepatitis, which is defined as when the portal inflammatory cells erode the limiting plate, which is between the portal tracts and the adjacent liver parenchyma. So you can see lots of inflammatory cells out here. You may see spotty necrosis. In addition, other findings which may help you in possible thinking of diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis includes plasma cells, which may be seen more in the inflammatory, in, as a major component in the inflammatory infiltrate, and a lymphocytic bile duct injury may also be seen. A very important finding, if you see, which points to a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis, or suggests, I'll say, is empiripolysis, which is engulfment of lymphocytes by hepatocytes. So if you can see, this is a small hepatocyte within this big hepatocyte. This is what we call as empiripolysis. In addition, you may see acinar transformation of hepatocytes, rosette formations, and ballooning of hepatocytes. In a patient's liver biopsy. Very important findings which may also help you in the assessment of severity of the autoimmune disease which the patient has is confluent necrosis and bridging necrosis. Confluent necrosis is defined as when the necrosis involves more than one zone within the lobule and when this necrosis extends from one lobule to another it is called as bridging necrosis. Important to signif significance of this finding is that it helps us in assessing the severity of autoimmune reaction 
And these patients may have a poor outcome and may have more complications in the long run. This is a typical liver biopsy of a patient with cirrhosis who had an underlying autoimmune hepatitis, where you can see is lots of fibrotic bands. And if you can see out here, there are small blue dots. These are your cells, that is the active inflammatory cells which are seen out here. So this is what we typically will cause as a cirrhosis with activity. So overall inflammatory grading and fibrosis staging as per the modified Ishak scoring gives us the information about the current disease activity and progression at the time of assessment. Important points for an alternative diagnosis of biopsy includes if you find granulomas, think about infective or PBC. If you see cholestasis, which is not very it's very uncommon in patients with AIH, think about overlap syndrome, fluorid ductal changes, think about an obstructive pathology. If you see eosinophils near the bile ducts, think about possibly does the patient have a drug-induced liver injury. If you see periductal fibrosis, think about primary sclerosing cholangitis. And an important fact to rule out is that these patients may also have associated non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So that will also be looked at in a liver biopsy. So, what does liver biopsy really also help us? So it also helps you in predicting outcome. So the patients who got increased activity on the biopsy have uh, all cause death or the requirement of transplant much higher as compared to those patients who got less activity on the liver biopsy. A point about the role of transient elastography, which may be either fibroscan, shear wave elastography, there is a lot of upcoming data on the possible role which transient elastography may play in the monitoring of patients with autoimmune hepatitis. But important fact which we need to keep in mind, transient elastography is affected by multiple factors, including trans, trans aminase elevation, presence of fat. So we need to keep those all those factors in mind while interpreting. But suffice to say that if in a patient you do serial fibroscans and you find that fibroscan values are coming down, that's suggestive of that the patient's fibrosis stage is coming down or a patient is also has an additional biochemical remission. So what is the role of serum biomarkers for fibrosis? Yes, we've got multiple serum biomarkers now available which may have commercial tests like fiber, fiber test or an enhanced liver fibrosis, that's the ELF score. In addition, we've got simple bedside, bedside tests which can be used to look out for severe fibrosis that's the APRI and the FIV4 score. So these are, but the interpretation of these tests needs to be done, keeping in mind that the patients who present to us acutely may have elevation of liver enzymes, and these tests may not fare well at the time of acute presentation. But once the patient is in remission, these tests may play a role in assessing or ruling out those patients who got advanced fibrosis. So out here, so far, we've talked about evaluation, diagnosis, investigation, role of liver biopsy and autoimmune markers. And I would take a break out here and would invite questions before we go on to the sixth, next part of the presentation that will be on management. Thank you, uh, Shalima. As you can see, there are a lot of questions already. Um, I'll just quickly move forward. Sandeep uh, Ratra from Jaipur. Ask, is liver biopsy a must or can we depend on the other surrogate markers? So as I have talked about, liver biopsy plays an, a, a major important role in making a diagnosis, though the findings are not specific, but helps in ruling out other causes. So if there are no contraindications contra for doing a liver biopsy, I would suggest every patient of autoimmune hepatitis, suspected autoimmune hepatitis should undergo a liver biopsy. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Patma Prakash from Delhi asks about whether if to ask for a history of alternate medications or supplements and whether that confuses the picture in autoimmune hepatitis. That's a very important point. So any kind of drug history needs to be asked and definitely complementary medicines, alternative medicines are known to have a presentation with similar liver function abnormalities and hence should always be asked for. Uh, Dr. Gunjan Joshi from Rajkot wonders whether you could have autoimmune hepatitis with normal enzymes. When, when, when would you suspect that or is that a possibility at all? So yes, definitely that is a possibility. 
And uh, so even like I'll, I'll give you a situation when we do not have transaminitis, your biopsy suggestive, that doesn't mean you leave that patient. Keep following up. The patient may have a flare over time and then we need to take a call when he needs to be treated. We'll talk about management in the subsequent part of the talk. Dr. Sanjeev Kaur from Katak asks, in the patient with suspected SLE and transaminitis, would you call that autoimmune hepatitis? So SLE per se is associated with autoimmune hepatitis. So one of the clinic, one of the diagnostic points is will include autoimmune hepatitis. So it's a part of the syndrome that's SLE and autoimmune hepatitis would be a part of SLE. So you need to manage both SLE and autoimmune hepatitis in that particular patient. I'll just stop with one last question from Dr. Bhavik Shah from Kolkata, who asks, uh, is there a role for uh, checking IgG4 and anti tech PTG levels in suspected autoimmune hepatitis? So if you are suspecting that you have a clinical suspicion of IgG4 disease, then go for IgG4 testing. Otherwise, IgG4 testing is not required for making a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. And for the celiac, yes, if you got a clinical suspicion, you should always ask for celiac serology. There's lots of reports now coming up with celiac disease to be associated with autoimmune hepatitis. So if there's clinical suspicion, you should go ahead and ask for the TTG estimation. Thank you, Dr. Shalima. I think there are many questions, but we'll move forward to keep that. Okay, good. So I'll move from now to the next part of my talk, which is the management of autoimmune hepatitis. So coming back to our case, our case was diagnosed as autoimmune hepatitis based on the clinical suspicions, laboratory parameters, positive autoantibodies, and a suggestive liver biopsy. So what do we do? You have ruled out all other causes. Now what? So do we treat? So we talked about the presentations. We've talked about the presentation of autoimmune hepatitis may vary from an acute presentation to retreat again. It may be an acute viral hepatitis-like picture, recurrent jaundice, acute severe autoimmune hepatitis, acute severe autoimmune hepatitis with acute liver failure, chronic hepatitis, cirrhosis, acute or chronic liver failure. So these would be the typical seven clinical scenarios with which a patient may present to you. And I will talk about each of these scenarios and their management in the subsequent slides. So the management of autoimmune hepatitis is in different steps. The first step is an induction step. So induction means that you treat these patients with drugs so as to get them to a remission state, which is your liver enzymes coming down, maintain them on drug therapy for long periods of time and watch for relapse and complications. So the question arises and what they raised a question in between, do I treat everyone? Yes, you should treat all patients with autoimmune hepatitis, but there are certain scenarios in which you may not treat, that is, in patients who got an inactive disease, and that is what they mentioned, and when you're having lots of drug side effects. Along with that, there comes a scenario when you've got lots of comorbidities like severe osteopenia, patients bedbound, patient has other comorbidities which preclude your drugs from being given, you've got lots of side effects occurring, so then at that juncture, you need to take a call whether do I need to treat such patients. And we'll discuss about these scenarios in the later half of the talk. So what are the drugs which we have in our armitarium for the management of autoimmune hepatitis? So the drugs includes steroids. Steroids includes prednisolone and budesonide. You've got anti metabolites like azathioprine. You've got drugs like mycophenolate morphetil you've got calcineurin inhibitors like acrolimus and cyclosporine. These drugs can be used either as first, op first line options, second line options, alone or in combination. We'll discuss about how do we approach and manage patients with these drugs. What I would also like to highlight out here, there are other drugs like infliximab, rutiximab, everolimus, sirolimus, which have been used in, and reported in case series for refractory patients to be of use. So we'll focus on all these drugs. And yes, these are the other options in your armamentarium when you do not have a response, you've got a refractory patient. Before we talk about 
the drugs. So when we made a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis, we talked about symptoms, we talked about liver enzymes, IgG, and histology. So when we treat, we monitor these only, these four factors. And that's how we define clinical remission as when you don't have any symptoms, your liver enzymes and IgG have returned back to their normal levels. Histology remission means when your histology doesn't show any kind of inflammation, interphase hepatitis, or any grade of fibrosis. Loss of remission means that the ALT have started to rise. There may be multiple causes. We'll talk about Biochemical relapse is defined as more than three times rise of ALT and elevated IgG levels in the range of more than two grams per deciliter. So my goal of treatment in autoimmune hepatitis is normalize the symptoms, normalize the ALT, normalize the IgG and histology. Once you've achieved, you've achieved a, a remission in such patients. How do you monitor? You monitor ALT at the start. You do it every three to four weekly. And once the patient is in remission, you take a call seeing him every three to six months. IgG, you can monitor every six months. Histology is a major, major issue. Like we raised a point in the question is, do I biopsy? If I am not keen for initial biopsy, how, do, how, how my patients are going to agree for a repeat biopsy? So it's very difficult. So here comes a role of possible transient elastography and the biochemical remission per se could be a surrogate marker for a histology. So what do I start as the first line regimen for my patients with autoimmune hepatitis who are either naive or have a relapse. So we talked about combination of steroids. Steroids includes prednisolone and budesonide. Combination of PRED and ASA and PRED has been shown to be better in inducing induction and has a reduction in mortality as compared to ASA alone. So while inducing, use combinations of PRED-ASA or PRED as compared to ASA. For maintaining PRED and ASA or ASA alone does well as compared to PRED alone. So maintain with a combination or ASA alone. The important question comes in, which Professor Saraswat also raised in the point of introduction was, what is the dose we use for PREDNIS alone? PREDNIS alone doses have been a very debated topic. Do you want to give 0.5 milligram per kg? You want to give one milligram per kg? This was an interesting study which showed two things. One, that the normalization of transaminases at six months ranged from almost like 50% to various studies ranging around 70%. The second important thing which gives this, this study tells us that the rate of remission was same in both the groups which received less than 0.5 and more than 0.5 milligram per kg per day of redness alone. So this suggests low dose may be equal to high dose for remission. There are different regimens which have been proposed by different guidelines. Easel typically would say start with red, 60 milligrams, one mg per kg, drop down by 10 for at the end of till four weeks, then drop by five, then drop by 2.5. Try maintaining on five for three months, and by six or nine months, take the patient off PRED and maintain only on ASA. And they also would suggest that add on ASA by the third week. When we start tapering, tapering depends on multiple factors, including the patient risk factors, patient response, the liver enzymes, how they are responding, play an important role regarding your tapering doses. And these are not very fixed schedules. The ASLD regimen is a little different and would suggest for Start with 60, drop down to 20 by next week, and then drop by 10. And add up as a, in the initial beginning, one to two milligram per kg, or take a half dose, that is 0.5 milligram per, the, uh, of per kg of red, that is 30 milligrams, and as a, right in the beginning, and then titrate your doses. Well, your response, which is seen in the initial eight weeks, has a very important role and helps you in predicting how your patient is going to do in the long run. So those patients who, is, who with initial immunosuppression have an 80% reduction of the AST levels do very well in the long run, as compared to those who do not have an initial response 
to the induction regimen. The second drug which we talked about in the steroid group was budesonide. The management protocols which have been given for autoimmune hepatitis are predominantly based on expert guidelines. We do not have randomized control trials. So there is, this is the only one randomized control trial which had a good sample size, that is comparing budesonide with prednisolone as an induction regimen. Budesonide as a drug, what we know, has a very high first part metabolism. The advantages of that is it causes less systemic side effects, especially wound phases and acne. These are your common side effects which occur in the female population, which constitutes a major chunk of autoimmune hepatitis. So we need to keep that in mind. And one important fact which I would like to point out here is, so far for budesonide, we've got only short-term data. Thus, the long-term use of budesonide leads to better outcomes we do not know. But what this study showed is that patients who were treated with budesonide as compared to prednisolone had a higher remission and when these patients, in the second part of the study, the patients who were on prednisolone were switched to budesonide, they also had a better response. Important point to remember, this study used budesonide only in those patients who were non-serotic. So safety of budesonide is only in those who are non-serotic, not in serotics where your side effects may be higher. MMF could be an alternative induction regimen along with prednisolone and has also has been shown to be of good results in patients with autoimmune hepatitis. So once we have started our patients, we are going to monitor him with clinical symptoms. We're going to monitor his liver function tests, IgG levels, and monitor for drug side effects. So this is the, la the last point is the drug side effects, which we usually miss while we start the patient on these drugs. Histology. Unfortunately, we cannot do it because patients may not comply. It has lots of ethical issues. So a biochemical remission may be an alternative surrogate for biopsy and transient elastography may also play a role. So those patients who got a biochemical remission that is normally LT and IgG will usually have a lesser activity on histology. But we all know that the histology is comes remission comes later than the biochemical remission. So coming back to our case, our patient's ALT had normalized. She was a young female, developed facial puffiness and gained weight. That was a major problem for her. So she switched to an alternative regimen, alternate day regimen on her own and then stopped. She presented back to us with jaundice. So do I stop immunosuppression in a patient with autoimmune hepatitis? Well, the data suggests that if you stop, there is a loss of remission in almost like 65% of patients at the end of one year, and almost like 90% of your patients are going to land up back to you within first five years. And the important factors which predict loss of remission when you stop therapy is young age, associated autoimmune diseases, which may be present along. So the treatment of autoimmune hepatitis is lifelong. There is a subgroup of patients who will always demand, okay, let me stop. You may take a call, but do need to prognosticate, do need to tell the patient the risk of relapse is always there. The factors which predict relapse are the levels of ALT at the time of withdrawal, the levels of IgG, which we were using as diagnosis and for management or monitoring, and in addition, a severe initial presentation, and when the patient has not tolerated the initial induction regimen, and a shorter treatment duration predict that your patient is going to have a relapse. It is very important when you start a patient on steroids, tell the side effects are going to come, especially the cosmetic ones. For the females are very important because once you start gaining weight, buffalo hump, it's a problem. And the, and the patient will not know why this is happening. And this may be a reason for stopping the treatment. In addition, steroids predispose you to diabetes, monitor sugars, Steroids leads to osteoporosis, supplement calcium, vitamin D in patients who are having osteoporosis, give them bisphosphonates. Consider doing DEXA in patients at regular intervals. Monitor for hypertension. Steroids increase your risk for developing hypertension. Eye symptoms, cataract, glaucoma is need to be looked at. And another important side effect which we need to keep in mind is 
the development of psychosis and myopathy, which may occur with long-term steroids being given to such patients. Azathioprine comes with its own range of side effects, including cytopenias. So when you start a patient on azathioprine, do ask for blood counts in the initial first two weeks to see how the patient's counts are going. And then once the patient is in remission, you may ask for counts at every three months. Other side effects include nausea, GI discomfort. You can split the dose or stop if it's severe. Pancreatitis is another severe side effect of azathioprine, which may occur very infrequently in these positions. Another important thing comes as TPMT estimation. So neither the phenotype nor the genotype predicts aza intolerance on an individual basis. It's not very essential to do a TPMT. In India, as such, the prevalence of the homozygous TPMT, which is associated with aza toxicity, is pretty less. So TPMT estimation can be considered prior to aza as suggested by the ASLD and the EASL guidelines. So our patient had side effects to steroids. In another clinical scenario, it may happen that the patient may not respond to prednisone. So what are my options when I'm treating such patients? So fall back to the second line drugs. Second line drugs includes MMF and tacrolimus. The data suggests that when you've got side effects to either pred or aza, use of either MMF or TAC may be equivalent. Whereas if you've got a non-response to pred or aza, TAC may do relatively better as compared to MMF. Both these drugs also come with their own side effect profile. And it is very important to remember that TAC may be associated with hypertension, kidney problems, infections, GI side effects, neurotoxicity, and leukopenia, which plays an important role in determining what drug you're going to give to your patient. MMF also has its own range of side effects, varying from hyperglycemia, leukopenia, hypertension, sometimes troublesome diarrhea may occur, and infections which are predisposed. So if you have a patient who's a non-responder, we talked about that the response rates for over six months to one year vary from 50 to almost like 80%. So most of your patients of autoimmune hepatitis which we talked about is chronic hepatitis, are going to respond to your induction regimen. If they are not responding, think about, is my diagnosis correct? Next, think about compliance. Many times, patients may not take medicines and may tell that they are taking, but they would not be taking the drugs. If you do not have a response, you can consider increasing the dose of the immunosuppression which you started, or consider alternative regimens, as we talked about, PAC and MMF. Check for vitamin D deficiency. It's been recent data suggests that patients who've got vitamin D deficiency may not respond, may have more complications, more progression of the disease. So we've talked about patients' management with chronic hepatitis. Now let's switch gears and talk about acute presentations. So our patient now is a patient who came to us, that's the next patient, who presented to us with a three weeks history. It's a short history with a very high bilirubin of 14, liver enzymes are in the range of 15 times, IgG level is two times, INR is 1.8. You did your autoantibody screen, none came positive, drugs and virals were all ruled out, all possible etiologies have been worked up and all serologies are negative. You went ahead and did a liver biopsy in this scenario. The liver biopsy was suggested for autoimmune hepatitis. So this kind of a clinical picture, which occurs in a short history, you got an elevated INR, your liver biopsy doesn't show you cirrhosis, is this what we define as acute severe autoimmune hepatitis. This subgroup of patients do respond well to steroids also. Well, the data would suggest 70% of your patients who have acute severe autoimmune hepatitis may have normal transaminases at the end of six months. Important question also comes in, what doses do I use? What this study showed us that use of smaller doses, that is less than 0.5, may also work well in patients with acute severe autoimmune hepatitis. So you have started your patient of acute severe autoimmune hepatitis on steroids. How do you follow it up? So follow-up is predominantly clinical along with your laboratory parameters. So if you consider giving steroids, monitor your patient daily. 
look at day seven, what this study showed is, if you look at scores like mel sodium or mel, a delta change at seven days may help you in deciding whether your patient is going to respond or not. The failure rate in patients with acute severe autoimmune hepatitis may be as high as 20%, and the mortality goes as high as 30% in these patients. So when a patient doesn't respond, you need to think about your options of transplant and get your transplant team informed right in the beginning that you've got a sick patient, you started him on steroids, he may respond, may not respond, and then you make a call regarding the transplant workup for them. So monitor at least at seven days, and then maybe a little beyond also, if you think that your patient is having a response continuously. If not, then take a call whether your patient needs a transplant workup and start it early. Another important group of presentation is an acute liver failure. So the patients with autoimmune hepatitis do not respond well to steroids. So these patients ideally should not be treated with steroids. AIH ALF has a poor outcome. A spontaneous survival is just 20%. So need to consider for options of transplant early. In this subgroup of patients with ALF, those who got high MELD score will perform the worst. So that's your subgroup, which is not going to respond to your immunosuppression. In addition, data would suggest that in this subgroup of patients with ALF, use of steroids may be associated with worsening of MELD scores and hepatic encephalopathy. In addition, steroids may also increase your risk of gram-negative sepsis and fungal infection. So you need to be very, very careful regarding starting of steroids. It's better to consider these patients with ALF for liver transplantation. Another interesting entity recently described is acute and chronic liver failure. Autoimmune hepatitis constitutes a very small fraction of the overall cohort of acute and chronic liver failure. Importantly to say is that these patients may be autoantibody negative. So even with an autoantibody negative, you've got a clinical suspicion, your biopsy is suggestive, keep a possibility of autoimmune AIH related acute and chronic liver failure. A subgroup of these patients can be treated with steroids as shown by this elegant study. Importantly to say that the patients who received steroids didn't have sepsis and no hepatorenal syndrome. So these were a very stable, without any associated significant organ failure like, which will respond. So you need to choose your patient very correctly. You don't choose, you land up in complications. What this study also showed that patients who got a higher age, those who got a higher male score, encephalopathy and advanced fibrosis do not respond well to the CLF and should be considered for transplant. The management of complications of cirrhosis for viruses, infections, hepatic encephalopathy, and hepatocellular screening are no different from any of the rest of the recommendations. So I'll not dwell upon all these complications. Important to talk about is liver transplantation. The indications remain the standard. If patients with acute liver failure, acute and chronic liver failure, and hepatocellular carcinoma should be considered for transplantation. These patients, when they undergo transplantation, have similar survivals to other indications. But important to remember is that autoimmune hepatitis can recur. One year recurrence rate would be around 12% and five year almost like 36%. Also these patients in the post-transplant period may have acute and severe rejections, which you need to keep in mind. Also there is an interesting entity, which is de novo autoimmune hepatitis. So a person who doesn't have an indication being autoimmune hepatitis for liver transplantation may develop autoimmune hepatitis after transplantation. The management and the evaluation is same for the rest of the autoimmune hepatitis group as we have discussed in the initial part of the talk. And an important question comes in, do we stop steroids in these patients who've got a liver transplant? So in a recent systematic review and meta-analysis published in hepatology, the SLD recommends, so this is a very conditional recommendation and of very low certainty that a gradual withdrawal of corticosteroids can be considered in patients after liver transplantation. So before I, I end my talk, I'll take you through a few special groups. A special group is one is cirrhosis. 
We know that cirrhosis patients are associated with a poor outcome and increased risk of death and liver transplantation as compared to those who do not have cirrhosis. Interesting data, which suggests that two things. One, your patients with cirrhosis will also respond to treatment with steroids. So, but the numbers are less. So almost 60% you know, of cirrhotic patients will also have a remission at six months as compared to 70% who do not have cirrhosis. And low dose, that is less than 0.5 milligram per kg per day of red, may do equally well as compared to a higher dose. The important fact is that you need to reduce the doses and keep the doses of Pycelone as little as possible if you can get away, because these patients may have some side effects and you need to monitor cirrhotic patients for other side effects of other drugs also. A special group is children. I didn't touch more on the pediatric aspect. Pediatric aspect is almost similar to that in adult aspect. Important differences. In children, even lower titers of autoantibodies are considered as significant. We talked about budesonide to be faring better as compared to prednisolone for non serotics in adults, whereas the data suggests that possibly budesonide may be not be a very good drug as compared to prednisolone in children. So in children, consider giving them PRED. And the response rates with PRED are almost similar in children and adults. And the side effect profile, which we talked about, budesonide was better in adults, somehow it doesn't fare well in children. Important to say this study is of a small sample size, but this is the only randomized control trial which we have available. So the data so far suggests that, yes, prednisolone may be better than budesonide in children. Another important difference is the PRED doses in children are a little higher than those required in adults, and response rates are also better in children. Pregnancy is an important issue which we need to talk about. Maternal complications, fetal complications are more, higher than the general population. These the patients who got cirrhosis have a lower live birth rate. Flares occur in those patients who have not been treated well in the uh, initial part of the pregnancy or the first year of conception. So those patients who are having activity will have a higher chance of getting complications during the pregnancy or later down the time. Usually flares occur in the postpartum period within the first three months after the delivery. And important to remember is that when you, your patients will usually be young females. So do a preconception counseling if they come to you at that time. Tell them about the compliance to drugs is very important. Maintenance of remission prior to pregnancy is important. And certain drugs which you need to keep in mind, you're not going to give that includes MMF, should not be given in patients who got pregnancy. Azathioprine may be present in low concentration in breast milk. Aza can be given in pregnancy, but there is some debate regarding use of Aza as during the breastfeeding period. So can be given, but there are some data to suggest it may not be very safe. Another important group is you got a patient who's 65, 70 years old, who's been diagnosed autoimmune hepatitis, do I treat him? So if your patient has no comorbidities, you can consider him for low doses of prednisolone or even budesonide and consider for rapid de-escalation and add on as a therapy. On the other side, you may have an elderly patient who's got lots of comorbidities, complications, hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, psychosis, and he doesn't have a very significant activity on his liver biopsy. Okay, you can take a call about wait and watch. It's not essential to treat such patients, though the recent data would suggest that adults, especially elderly, respond very well as compared to those who are young people. So response rates are good. Response is not an issue with the elderly population. In the current day scenario, things are changing. Autoimmune hepatitis is, may come up along with an associated bag of other autoimmune diseases. So when we are managing such patients, we need to also take care of that in one managing associated PSC, PBC, viral hepatitis, DILI, diabetes, if it is their thyroid problem. So all these comorbidities have to be managed. These are part of your management of autoimmune hepatitis. See, obesity can be associated with uh, autoimmune hepatitis. It's important to manage both these diseases together. The scenario with COVID, we're going to see lots of COVID in the next couple of uh, months. I hope it goes off than what is being predicted. So in patients who are COVID negative, who are immunosuppression, there is no data to suggest that we should uh, reduce immunosuppression as to suggest that uh, these patients probably are not predisposed with immunosuppression for COVID infections. 
But if you have an AIH with COVID infection, consider lowering the immunosuppression. These guidelines are by the ASLD based on the general principles for management of infections in immunosuppression and to decrease risk of super infection. Hygiene is the most important and that's how we need to manage such patients. So to summarize, when you see a patient with autoimmune hepatitis, first thing is look at your clinical presentation. If a patient has an overlap, comorbidities manage along with the autoimmune hepatitis, all these factors will help. If your patient has an ALF, ACLF or a decompensated cirrhosis, think about considering for a liver transplant early. You can consider immunosuppression in a select group of patients and then keep them under close follow-up and think about liver transplant as a good option. In patients who are non cirrhotics budesonide is a better induction agent as compared to prednisolone. Whereas in cirrhotics, prednisolone is better. You need to combine with azathioprine. You may receive a biochemical remission in almost like 70 to 80% of patients, 60 to 70% in cirrhotics. Try to taper on the off the steroids as, as possible. Come down to minimum doses and take them off if possible. If you've got a patient who's intolerant, think about second line drugs as an option. If a patient doesn't respond, gets complications, decompensation, insufficient response, transplant is an option. If you have an insufficient response, which may happen in almost like 15 to 20 percent of your patient, always reconsider whether my diagnosis is correct or not. Confirm the compliance with the patient. You can consider hiking up the doses of ASA or consider second line drugs. And if you still do not have a response and patient gets complications, think about transplant as an option. So with this, I would like to end my talk and raise a question out here. And we like to have an audience poll on that. So our question for the day is, Miss Y, she's a 26 year old young lady with autoimmune hepatitis is contemplating pregnancy. Her liver function showed a bilirubin of 1.1, AST of around 150, albumin of 3.6. What is your advice? The options include the fourth, can plan pregnancy immediately, risk of complications are same in the general population, optimize immunosuppression prior to conception, and MMF is a safe second line drug in pregnancy. Can we have answer, Amol? Just give me a second, sir. Meanwhile, we go to next question. Okay. So maybe Amol can give so the answer if he has. Just hold on, sir. It is shared on your screen, sir. Okay, so so almost uh, ninety percent people have said uh, option three, that is optimized immunosuppression prior to conception. I think uh, that's a very good thing. Like everybody is very attentive and was listening to all the things. That's a very good take from there. Okay, let me go on to the next question. And that's the last question which I have before we open the uh, house for discussion. Uh, Miss YY, 46 year old, had no comorbidities, presented with three weeks history of jaundice, liver function which revealed a total bill of seven, ALT of 150, albumin 3.4, INR is two, creatinine 0.8, she's oriented, there are no flaps, liver biopsy suggests autoimmune hepatitis, F3 fibrosis, all other etiologies have been ruled out. What is the next step? Artimina suppression, consider for transplantation, start n cysteine in ALF doses, consider as adding azathioprine in the dose of two milligram per kg per day on the day one of the management.
your answers on the screen, sir. Yes, Samal. Uh, let's see the answer. A lot of people on Facebook have also responded, and they're all saying one. Let's see. Uh, almost uh, uh, say eighty percent would say start steroid, and thirteen percent would say that uh, immediately for transplantation. And Salima mentioned that. And okay, most so Facebook had said uh, start steroid. Okay, so that would be the best approach in uh, as the first line of management in such a clinical scenario where we got an acute severe autoimmune hepatitis, start steroids, keep under close monitor. The patient doesn't respond, develops more complications, develops HE out here that is going from acute severe to an acute liver failure like presentation, think about transplantation as an option. Okay, so with this, I like to open for questions from the house. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shaliman. That has been really an outstanding presentation. I think you've uh, met all the uh, points that I'd pointed out that yes, you'd be covering them so thoroughly. In fact, could you, you stop sharing your screen? I have stopped sharing. Right. So I think we'll move on to the next seven, eight minutes. I'll try and cover some of the questions. Uh, you have provoked a flood of questions. There have been already about 225 or 225 questions that have come in. And I'm pretty sure just uh, like me, uh, Uday Zakaria must also be struggling to keep up with this uh, spate of questions. Now, to begin with, the first question I have for you is an interesting case scenario. Uh, you talked about special situations. Well, Dr. Simna from Trivandrum has given us a case scenario of a, a young patient with, who presents with high bilirubin, high enzymes 500 to 600, high INR 2.2, IgG total is 6,000. KF ring positive, high urinary copper and celluloplasmin less than is around 11, while autoantibodies, anti rho liver cytosolic mm -hmm. antibody are present. So, profile of an acute liver failure with AIH and Wilson's disease. So in this scenario, what would you do? And there are at least two or three other questions on the same theme, uh, which I'll uh, just touch once you could just elaborate on uh, this scenario. Several people so are interested in this combination. So if we are talking about an acute severe autoimmune hepatitis, options of steroids are always there. If you've got an acute liver failure-like presentation, you can consider these patients as first line for liver transplantation. Now, what scenario we talked about is, is a bit of overlap between Wilson's. We are not very sure. I hope that our liver biopsy has been done. Our pathologist has given us some of a clue. For Wilson's disease, yes, plasma exchange has been shown to be of some importance. So over here, the, the situation will depend upon if I'm very sure of my diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis, I may consider giving a trial of steroids, keeping a very close follow. -up. Other options like plasma exchange can be considered. Keep your options, patients not responding, think about transplant. Right. In, on, in the same vein, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Prem Lata from Trivandrum has said that she has had a young lady like this with this presentation, acute liver failure, markers of Wilson's and autoimmune both present, who has shown a dramatic response to corticosteroid therapy and wants to know how should she produce, proceed further. Biopsy has not yet been done. So you need to, so once we have started this patient on steroids, then we need to follow it up. So these patients do will have a good response as what we discussed about acute severe autoimmune hepatitis may have a 70% remission. So keep your patient under follow-up. Repeat your test for Wilson's again, whether they were false positive or what kind of scenario does the patient evolve into. So keep following up the patient. So currently, continue the immunosuppression and follow up. Right. Okay. Uh, I think you briefly touched on this scenario, but maybe you could amplify it further. Dr. Dattatre from Mumbai has a patient whom he has diagnosed as probable autoimmune based on the simplified uh, scoring system and who's also COVID positive. So uh, when to do liver biopsy? Uh, he says corticosteroids have been started as part of COVID treatment and uh, it's early. So, I mean, but should he be biopsy? Then how would one proceed in this scenario? So current situation, current recommendations from all the experts would be is to avoid biopsy, avoid invasive procedures right now. You will never be sure whether the level of rise in transaminitis is because of autoimmune hepatitis, the drugs used to treat autoimmune hepatitis, because most of the drugs which are currently being advised, though none recommended, many of them have hepatotoxic effects. 
So we need to keep that in mind. Plus flares, plus superimposed viral infections. So right now would be is just wait and watch. Do not biopsy. See how the patient evolves. We avoid giving them immunosuppression right now. First is get them COVID negative, then consider treating the autoimmune hepatitis. Yes, I think um, unless it's an acute fulminant presentation, doesn't give you time, then you may have a different dilemma. But to uh, wait out COVID and then proceed with the AIH, maybe the, what you're advising is uh, uh, probably the best uh, thing to follow. Uh, Professor, uh, well, Dr. Shiva Prasad from Vishakapatnam wants to know your take on this. He says that for raised IgG, you give a score of 1 when the score is at one uh, fold above normal is in the normal range. But the moment it moves up to 1.1 fold above normal, your score moves up to 2. So how accurate and how reliable is the measurement of IgG and its variability that minute changes in IgG may change your uh, simplified and your uh, uh, AI scoring? What do you think? What's your view on that? So that's a very pertinent uh, question from uh, Professor Siva Prasad. Important fact which I would like to raise is your diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis is not based on your scores itself. You're looking at, yes, the higher the score makes you to a diagnosis specific, even a lower score. If you have a clinical scenario, typical picture, ruled out everything, do consider a possibility of autoimmune hepatitis. Yes, a little, these cutoffs are very arbitrary. So a little up and down, take your clinical judgment regarding the management, not go by the absolute cutoffs. So don't, don't be a slave to the numbers. Look at the big picture. Correct. Right. Okay. I think um, uh, zero negative autoimmune hepatitis is something that at least uh, four or five people, including Bhavik Shah from Kolkata, Bhavesh from Lucknow, Vivek Bhatia from New Delhi have asked about. When do you suspect or, uh, or zero negative autoimmune? What, uh, how do you diagnose it and how would you manage it? So the presentation of zero negative is almost similar to as a zero positive. You're looking at a typical clinical scenario. You got an associated clinical situation where you think my patient may be an autoimmune hepatitis patient. So you've asked for ANA, LKM, ASMA, they're negative. There is there you're going to label a patient as zero negative autoimmune hepatitis. And this constitutes a fraction of almost like 20% of our patients which you'll see. If a patient comes to you with a more severe acute presentation on ALF or an ACLF like picture, your autoantibodies may be negative in almost like 50% of the patients. So if you have a typical clinical scenario, the rest of the parameters are going, do not worry about one factor that is negative autoimmune antibody. Take a clinical judgment regarding making a diagnosis. All right. Um, uh, on, these, uh, on these similar lines, I think Dr. Um, Sharad Dev from Varanasi wants to know that in a patient with the, um, who's, you have tested, sorry, this is Dr. Sanjeev Thakur from Patna. If ANA is positive what, and uh, other features fit in with autoimmune disease, what is the utility for testing for other markers, ASMA, um, LKM, et cetera? Okay, so two points out here I'll make is like, if you're looking at autoantibody markers, ASMA is the only autoantibody which is very specific for autoimmune hepatitis. The rest of them may be very non-specific and may not be. And ANA is associated with multiple other autoimmune diseases. So ANA is not very specific for autoimmune hepatitis. Second point is regarding the prognosis. SMA also may be associated with the histological activity index. So that there comes a role. Apart from that, we should not monitor serially all these autoantibodies while managing or treating such patients. Right. So there was a similar question on, is there any utility in looking at the titer of ANA to assess response? And uh, finally, regarding response, people wanted to know what is a definite response? Is it complete normalization? Or you would expect 1.5 times upper limit of normal for uh, OTPT as a response to steroids and then plan for tapering? So that's a, a little, that's a clinical judgment. So once you have started the patient on immunosuppression, you let the transaminases fall down. And once you see a trend of falling transaminases, you start tapering the trans. Regarding the titers, titers, the available techniques for looking at autoantibodies include indirect immunofluorescence and ELISA. Most of the results what we get is 1 is to 20, 1 is to 40, 1 is to 160. These are based on indirect immunofluorescence. ELISA, we still are not very, very sure what cutoff level. ELISA is going to give you a value. And serial titers have no role in the management or prognostication or follow-up of patients with autoimmune hepatitis. Right. I think a couple of um, uh, other questions that I'll quickly uh, take you through. 
डॉक्टर राजेंद्र फ्रॉम मैंगलोर वॉन्ट्स टू नो कैन एल्फा फिटो प्रोटीन बी रेज इन ऑटो इम्यून हेपेटाइटिस एंड इफ सो if uh, if should the cut off values in a patient with ih for suspecting hcc be different uh, and how do you in interpret mild changes in uh, elevations of afp in the setting of autoimmune with regeneration so that's a very pertinent point alpha fetoprotein is a marker for hcc and if you see that your serial afp is rising yes regeneration is a thing where you may have a little fallacies but even if you find such a rise and the patient has cirrhosis patients with autoimmune hepatitis do go on to develop hcc the rate of development of hcc in patients with autoimmune hepatitis is much lower as compared to other viral etiologies so if you have an elevation in alpha beta protein always do an imaging rule out a tumor because you may pick up a tumor earlier and you may treat you may have definite options ahead of you so don't accept minor minor elevations as part of regeneration rule out hcc keep that in mind it's possible it may be because of regeneration but always rule out hcc okay i think there is a whole lot of questions in fact over a dozen people would have asked this so it's very difficult to take all the names but i'd briefly mention dr ashish chand dr tarun kumar from bhopal dr priya ratna from colombo and all of them are centering around liver biopsy uh, uh, one scenario is in decompensated cirrhosis um uh, in people with liver uh, where you strongly suspect autoimmune what is the role of liver biopsy should we do a tglb should we do a biopsy at all so that's a that's a that's a very important question is because that comes with practical management when you're doing so if available biopsy you can do a percutaneous in a stable patient who is not decompensated you got a patient who is sick who's got coagulopathy where you got a problems with doing a percutaneous biopsy think about transtubular looking at a patient who's got decompensated cirrhosis what really are we going to achieve, achieve by looking at this biopsy is very is 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 a point with decompensated cirrhosis you're looking at you're not giving immunosuppression you're going to consider him for transplantation so i would not be very keen in jumping into doing a liver biopsy situation so transplant options are available you don't have you want to still think about pushing your limits of giving something giving something doesn't mean you start harming the patient by giving immunosuppression these patients may be at more risk of having more complications with immunosuppression this is not a stable cirrhotic it's a decompensated cirrhosis you to dispose him to have more complications i would be a little worried to burn my hands by doing a liver biopsy situation so unless the patient is a transplant candidate and is eligible and is willing for transplant there may not be much gain therapeutic gain in doing a biopsy in a decompensated cirrhotic would that sum it up yes that would and similarly in the setting of acute liver failure especially zero negative uh, if there are some clues like igg elevation or ana weekly positives should people go ahead and use therapy or you would uh, be insisting on liver biopsy before a diagnosis of eih is made so these markers igg or auto antibodies are very not specific they may be falsely elevated in other etiology to be sure that you are dealing with an autoimmune hepatitis because out here you are considering immunosuppression which may also have an harmful effect patients with alf as the data suggests do not respond well to steroids so consider them for transplantation okay. rather than giving them immunosuppression okay so that would be my take on that well i think um, the number of questions posed to you as is pushing 300 by now so you going to have a lot of homework shalimar after this so i'll uh, request uh, dr uday zakaria i'm sure he has also identified multiple uh, questions so to please go ahead and uh, pose them to you in the next several 5 uh, 7 minutes uh, is dr zakaria yes sir uh, thank you sir uh, yes we have reached a triple century in questions uh, i i just try to keep it very brief and uh, touch on uh, each uh, each of the therapeutic modalities so uh, one question asked is was from dr gaurav gupta from jaipur and uh, the associate question was by dr ramakant reddy from hyderabad question specifically is in the setting of alf is there a role of methylprednisolone or ivig so for alf what we talked about steroids are associated with its own problems steroids do not improve the outcome they also increase your risk of developing more sepsis especially gram negative and fungal sepsis so you need to be very very careful when you are treating patients with alf 
in contrast to acute severe autoimmune hepatitis with steroids. Data so far suggests you may not benefit much by steroids. If options for liver transplantation are available, go for liver transplantation. If that option is not available, you can discuss with the patient. Do you want to take the risk of developing complication and all your efforts may be futile? Yes, there is data of use of even methylpred in such patients, but you need to explain the risks. And the data so far doesn't suggest a very positive role of steroids in acute liver failure setting. I, I move on to some azathioprine related questions. Uh, so one of the questions was from Dr. Rajesh from Salem, who asked, is azathioprine safe in pregnancy? So uh, there's a lot of data now available, especially in the IBD group also, is like as I safe in pregnancy, you can continue. There's a lot of debate, but so far, the gist of it is as I can be given in pregnancy without any associated increased risk of complications. But problems comes in when you're looking at a breastfeeding, there are a bit of still a little debate, but most people or experts would suggest is like even you can continue as a in breastfeed, but some would say, okay, you may consider stopping as a. This is in contrast to MMF and PAC, which needs to be stopped in pregnancy. Dr. Sinha from Truvandrum and Dr. Vineet Mishra from Varnasi asked specifically about azathioprine induced pancreatitis and the role of TPMP. You've mentioned it, but just for I like. Yeah, so uh, pancreatitis is a little uncommon presentation with AZA. It can occur, and, and everybody would have seen patients. Uh, uh, in the uh, tertiary care centers of as I induced pancreatitis. Once you get one episode of as I induced pancreatitis, you've all ruled out all other causes of pancreatitis. Think about possibly that the pancreatitis was due to as I and stop and should not reintroduce the drug. TPMT, yes, there's a bit of debate. There's multiple published data from uh, uh, India itself also that uh, the TPMT levels really do not predict the outcome or complications which you're looking at in liver disease patients. And it's considered as optional if you want to do as of, it may not be very cost, it may not be very cost effective to do APMT levels in as in general in use for liver diseases. Uh, moving on to uh, tacrolimus and MMF questions. Dr. Pavan Anichanale from Pune asked, can MMF be considered as a first line therapy rather than azathioprine, considering that azathioprine takes a while to act. Uh, I think the suggestion is really great. There is even data available where you can, in place of aza, you can use MMF and prednisolone as the starting regimen and maintain patients on MMF. Similar is there is some data available on TAC. TAC can also be a good option. So both these options are available and you need to choose drugs depending upon the drug side effect, the patient's profile, and, and, and the availability and what the patient is comfortable with regarding the drugs. Uh, the last question is from, uh, actually it was the first question, I kept it for the last, Dr. Sai Prasad from Mumbai uh, asked about the role of biologics, the evolving role of biologics in unresponsive autoimmune hepatitis. So, so you, what we talked about so far, let me just summarize, almost like 60 to 80 percent or 75 percent of your patients are going to respond to your first line inductions, that is PRED and ASA. If you do not have a response in PRED and ASA, you switch to PAC, MMF. Another 20 to 30% or say 40% of these patients are going to respond. You'll still be remaining with a subgroup of patients who do not respond. There are case reports, patients with series of seven, 10 patients of use of rituximab, use of infliximab. They are associated with good outcomes in another 30 to 40% of patients. So yes, in refractory patients, non-responders who do not have a response, you can take a call of all these options as possible drug therapies for management. So that's an option. But you need to individualize, talk to the patient about the drug side effects, associated advantages, cost, and all those things need to be discussed. Thank you, Dr. Shalima, for so clarifying so well for all of us. I'll hand over now to uh, Professor Makari. Uh, thank you, Salima, for your wonderful talk. And let me ask one or two questions which are there in the Facebook, which are not, uh, uh, which Dr. Saraswat uh, and uh, Dr. Uday might not have access. Well, the question is, uh, uh, there's a patient who has a compensated acidosis, has normal enzymes, his AN is negative, but IgG is 2000. Now this question is from Alex Smart, and he wants to know what should we do, because his IgG, his idiopathic uh, 
or cryptogenic cirrhosis, but IgG is 2000. Should you treat or you just follow? So out here is a scenario, the, what is there on histology? If there is activity on the histology, I would like to consider a possible option of treatment. Okay, I take a situation where there is no activity, liver enzymes normal, IgG is normal. We have made a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. I take a call not to treat a patient as we know that patients who got a less histological activity who are asymptomatic may do well. But these patients need to be followed. Autoimmune hepatitis is not a static disease. It has flares of transaminases in between. So it is possible that your patient may flare up. Patient may have later down the time elevation in IgG levels also. Keep a close follow up of that patient in case you don't plan to treat. But if cirrhosis with activity, Patient symptomatic is developed cirrhosis may be considered for treatment also. And one of the questions from Asmit uh, Chaudhary from Indore, that uh, how common do you find IgG4 along with uh, AIH? So that's a very, very uncommon scenario. You don't see it very frequently. So even once you're looking at elevated IgG4 levels, presence of extra biliary involvement should take you to a diagnosis of IgG4 related disease. It may occur, very, very uncommon. I think in, in, in interest of time, we'll have to stop. We have a, almost 318 questions, and I think we discussed about 30 or 40 questions. We could make, make this point of time. But certainly, all the questions are on your way to, uh, way to you, Salimar. And if you can work on these questions, I think our viewers will get a lot of benefit from your expertise and your amount, the vast amount of knowledge you have on this subject. I think all of, all of us will agree on that, that uh, the, your lecture was a, a really, really master class. And you made some very, very important point, including that uh, AIH is a lifelong disease. And therefore, most patients will require lifelong monitoring and treatment. And that's a very, very important point we made. Uh, and you also said that uh, when to suspect overlaps and uh, if you suspect and what to do and uh, how do you make a diagnosis. The importance of liver biopsy is a lot of us has a confusion that uh, when to do liver biopsy, because a lot of patients would, uh, will say no liver biopsy. But no, you give almost clear guidelines at what one should do while treating these patients. And with this, I think we'll have to uh, end here with this lecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Salimar, for a, a wonderful lecture. I think it's very useful. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uday, for joining uh, this masterclass uh, and the amount of depth of knowledge you had, the kind of question you chose for discussion were really, really remarkable. And this, this uh, uh, proves a point that uh, the amount of knowledge and depth you have in the subject. Thank you, Dr. Saraswat, to, to making always these master classes very, very lively and very, very interactive. Uh, before we go to, uh, before we close, a uh, couple of things to, uh, for the next uh, uh, session. We have a next lecture coming on 14th of uh, June, and that's again an uh, important topic that is uh, how do you, uh, you uh, how do you treat and, and diagnose and treat a neuroendocrine tumor? And we'll focus mainly upon those neuroendocrine tumors who, who are detected incidentally. You do endoscopy and find a uh, polyp and you find neuroendocrine tumor. So how do you proceed on these patients? And uh, this is a real clinical issue. And for this, we have invited Dr. Uh, Amrinder Singh Puri. Uh, he's from New Delhi. Uh, he was head of department of gastroenterology at GV Pant Hospital. Now he is moved to Vedanta Hospital in Gurgaon. So we'll, we'll have his talk on 14th of uh, uh, June at 12 to 1. We also, you also know that uh, all these master classes have been put on ISG library. So one can visit ISG website and look at ISG library. And all these lectures uh, have been put there along with answer to uh, the questions. And one can visit at any point of time. We also want to uh, tell you that uh, a uh, lot, uh, lot of people who are viewing this, uh, they want to become a member of ISC. And many ask that, uh, how, much do I, how much do we have to pay to attend these master classes? And we tell them that it's all, all free. And all our speakers are so gracious uh, that they work so hard uh, to prepare for these lectures. And lastly, we are going to send to you the feedback form again uh, to get uh, your feedback and uh, also the topics you want to listen uh, in this masterclass. With this, uh, thank you everyone. Thank you technical team. Thank you Dinesh, Amol, Ramesh, Yogita, and everyone
for this wonderful, wonderful masterclass. See you on June 14 at 12 to 1 on yet another topic that is neuroendocrine tumor. Okay, with this, bye bye, and uh, we can log off uh, spine. See you on 14th of June. Thank you. Bye bye.